We'd like to thank FETC again and <coughs> encourage you to check out FETC. Uh, they have an incredible array of speakers um, and they're expecting something like on the order of 20,000 people coming down to Orlando, Florida um, to discuss the role of technology in education, the different roles of technology in education. It's going to be real and, and incredible event this year. Um, well, it is every year, but this year is going to be even better. And I'd just like to encourage you to go to www.fetc.org and check it out. Um, and if you're there, hopefully, um, hopefully we can bump into each other. Uh, I'm, I'm generally there. So then also coming up on Itchat Interactive, we have a really interesting session tomorrow night with Fred Ende. Um, you know, tonight we're talking about the intentional use of education technology. Tomorrow night, we're talking about the intentional use of professional development. Uh, too often, professional development is just staged because it has to be there. But, um, but it can have a remarkable effect for all of us on improving our craft. And Fred Ende, who's written a book for ASCD, or a series of books for ASCD, is going to be leading a discussion on how do we make professional development really. That's tomorrow night. Um, on November 9th next week, we have uh, the third in the series from Howard Knopf. Uh, this time, he's talking specifically about interventions for challenging students. He's been talking about classroom management, and, um, and he's, he's awesome. It, it, his information has been incredibly timely and valuable for those of us who, who participated. And then on November 10th, we resume the C series by talking to Ann McMullen about leading change in challenging times. As teachers, we're all leaders to a large extent, and, uh, and it's time for us to take the mantle and really lead the change so that education becomes what we all want it to be. Uh, so that'll be an interesting conversation also next week, November 10th. Uh, just go to www.edchatinteractive.org. Uh, click on the upcoming web events, and um, just as you did here, register for one of these events. Uh, they, sh they should be really interesting. And um, now, without further ado, um, I'd like to bring up Mary. Uh, Mary has been Assistant Superintendent for Education um, for the past 11 years, and she's written a number of books, and the her most recent book is Common Core and the special education student. So let me stop this and I'll bring Mary up. So, hi. Hi, Mitch. So, you know, I guess there's, there's a couple things. that we, You and I were kind of joking in the beginning. Um, you, you really, you don't shy away from competition. I mean, there's going to be a, there's going to be a couple people who are going to be watching the World Series, but you just decided you're going to go right at them and 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 run this event tonight. Absolutely. I mean, I live in LA. Since the Dodgers aren't playing, you know, it's it's all it's all over. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> I'm sure so, people will have it on in the background. And then and then getting back, you know, I I was looking at the title, and you could have just said use of education technology to meet the needs of learners in the classroom. And yet you have there's three qualifiers there in in the title. There's in, you know it's intentional use of technology to meet the needs of all learners in an inclusive classroom. And I don't think it was by accident that you chose there's there. Could you just elaborate that a little on that a little bit? No, you're very correct. Sometimes I found that teachers get very excited about educational technology and they find a new tool and they use it, but they really don't know why they're using it and they don't really know what learning goal they're trying to accomplish with that. And so that's why that word intentional is in there. Um, certainly inclusive classrooms are important and my background is special education and general education, but for all special needs learners and our gifted learners too, technology can be an amazing tool for them, not only for engagement, but for accomplishing goals. So that's why those two are very important in my opinion. And then the all learners? I'm not going to let you get off the hook that easy. No, and, and for all learners, and we're going to talk a little bit tonight about universal design for learning, but technology can um, reach every single learner because it removes barriers. 
Okay, well, then uh, I'll pull myself down. I'll get your slides up, and let's let's get going. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Mitch, and welcome, everyone. Uh, this is an exciting platform, and it's fun to be a part of Shindig. And I also would encourage you to come to the FETC conference. It's going to be really quite amazing, and there will be a special education strand as well, so that if you have special needs learners in your classroom, um, you can come and take a look at some ways to really facilitate technology to assist for all learners. So, Mitch, why don't we go ahead and start in on the slides. These are my outcomes for tonight, um, that we take a look at how we use universal design, that we look at some terminology, uh, and make sure that we're defining terminology well, that we take a look at strategic planning for technology in a very strategic, informed way to support a learning goal. We look at each specific kinds of technology to meet needs, and I will give you some um, ideas for some technology that you may want to try out if you don't know about it already and that we can take a look at how we target specific learner outcomes. So let's move on to the next slide then. And this slide really is what you, you already know this or you wouldn't be tuned into this ed chat, that technology really is a tool for access. It's access information, but even more importantly now, with your new state standards and the high level of rigor of those standards and the resulting curriculum, Technology is a great tool for accessing that curriculum. And in fact, in your state standards, there are technology-driven um, standards where students need to have a level of dig digital literacy in order to accomplish that standard. And so it is built in. It's highly engaging, and it does remove barriers and facilitates understanding on a deeper, deeper level than regular curriculum. So the next slide, then, we can take a look at some of the terms. Uh, sometimes we hear people talk about technology for special education students, and we hear the term assistive technology, or we hear the term adaptive technology. And so I just wanted to make sure that we have some common understanding. Assistive technology is really specific to an individual learner's needs and it's used to overcome a handicap or to remove that barrier that is there as a result of a handicap. An example might be a wheelchair, um, text-to-speech for visually impaired, hearing impaired students can benefit from closed captioning and recording devices for students with memory disabilities. Adaptive technology, the de de definition really is that it's designed to increase or maintain the capabilities. So enlarged print, voice over text to speech again, um, and enlarged keyboards. So you can see that there is overlap. And so if you hear the term assistive technology, that is kind of a large umbrella for adaptive technology. But now, with technology being embedded into all learner curriculum, it's really all educational technology. So the next slide talks about um, how IDEA, or our federal law relating to special education, defines, and, and IDEA uses the word, terms assistive technology device. And so you can see the definition there that is in the law, just in case you wanted to refer to that. So the next slide really is the umbrella, and this is my term uh, and my definition for educational technology use. And as Mitch mentioned beforehand, it's, it's facilitated learning and improving student performance by use of uh, appropriate and strategically selected technology tools and resources. There is a reason for every single piece of educational technology that you use, and the reason needs to relate to your educational learner outcomes. So in the next slide, we talk about banning the average. And I'm going to give you a little bit of homework tonight. If you take a look at that YouTube um, URL at the very bottom of the page, there is an outstanding video done by Dr. Todd Rose with the CAST Institute, and he's with Harvard University. And he talks about the Air Force and what can we learn from the Air Force when they wanted to order new jets 
And they didn't have an average size pilot. They said, you have to design to the edges. Every single one of our pilots needs to be able to reach every single switch in that cockpit. And it is an outstanding video to watch and to show to educators at your school sites or in your districts because it really helps you think about education in a different way. That every single learner in the classroom is a special learner. And so we need to design so that all of those learners have access, not just that average third grade student or that average eighth grade student. So universal design for learning is an exciting tool and technology is often a very big piece of that. So the next slide really kind of emphasizes that thinking, that, that growth mindset thinking from students being disabled to being differently abled. And every single classroom has a, a, a differently abled students sitting in there. So technology can really make the difference there. So the next slide really kind of gives you a graphic and it's all about access. It's how can we provide access to the key concepts, the key standards, the learning and the collabor collaboration that is aligned with your state standards. And so we can see that it is balanced with universal design, but it's also balanced with supports and strategies and technology is a big piece of that. So the next slide kind of shows you, if you're not familiar with universal design for learning, I would highly encourage you to um, get familiar with it and find out information about it, attend a conference, jump in on a, an ed chat or uh, a, a online tutorial about universal design. It is really looking at how the brain learns and it is talking about designing lessons from the very beginning to the edges not just for the average learner and then we take away or add on. It is designing it so everyone has access. So there are three major areas of learning in the brain and they relate to these three parts of universal design. Means of representation, means of action and expression, and means of engagement. So with the next slide, you can see the transition we are really moving from teaching and learning being a presentation environment where the teacher is the sage on the stage and is it's, uh, spewing information, if you want to use that word. Uh, we're really moving to more instructional learning environments where students can be independent learners and engaged in their learning. And so universal design and technology really can facilitate that. So I'm just going to walk you through on the next slide the beginning part of UDL, and that is multiple means of representation. If you think about starting a new lesson or selecting a new learning goal, the first thing that general ha generally happens is that, that the core concepts are represented in some way. The teacher plans on how to get across to the students the core concepts of that particular learning goal. And so we can look at multiple ways of doing that. And in that way, we reach all the learners in the classroom. Using visuals and media is an important way. Uh, visual tours, virtual tours of environments that we're talking about. Online graphic organizers and apps are a terrific way to do that highlighting text, chunking information, and videos and whiteboard videos. So all of those tools can be a part of multiple means of representation. We move to the next one, which is multiple means of action and expression. And this is what students are doing. Now that the teacher has facilitated learning of new chunks of content or core information, then the students interact with that in some way and they provide uh, a, a some way of representing what they've learned. So they do an action or an expression of what they've learned. Technology can be a major tool with that in terms of electronic posters or bulletin boards, um, recording a song, creating a video scene, even creating a tweet. Um, creating a Padlet bulletin board and uh, 
creating something that demonstrates that the students, in fact, do understand the concept of that. And then the third slide with uh, UDL is multiple means of engagement. Now, recently, the CAST Institute actually moved this one to the very beginning, which is excellent because if our students aren't engaged, they're not going to be learning. And so this underlies everything that goes on in the classroom. And by building in multiple means of representation and action, we are engaging students. And so many times we can use technology checklists, um, scaffolds, rubrics, media and themes of high interest, which is facilitated through technology, various levels of challenge for all of our learners in our classroom, giving feedback throughout the assignment and discussing how is this relevant to students' lives at the very beginning of a lesson. So that's the fastest overview you will ever have of universal design for learning. But I hope that it kind of stimulated your thought processes in terms of, A, am I designing my lessons in that format? Am I thinking about every learner in my classroom when I'm planning my lesson and building in multiple means of representation, action, expression, and engagement? And if so, how am I doing that? So I want this to be a time to kind of stimulate a conversation for you. And Mitch, maybe you can facilitate a, a quick share that um, our viewers and participants can either talk to each other or respond um, with the, the chat line. How have you, are there some ways that you've used technology in a UDL lesson? Right, so this would be the time then for for people to click, uh, if you have a webcam and a microphone, uh, to talk to another participant, right? So click on the avatar, somebody else here, and I'll bring Mary down so you can actually click on her avatar also, um, you know, and, and discuss it with her. Um, I'll bring the slide back up in a, in a second. Uh, so that would be number one is click on somebody's avatar and, and get into a discussion with the person about how s some of those different methods of, of, um, of presentation, of output, and understanding uh, you could or you have used in the classroom and discuss them with somebody else. And if you don't have a webcam, then please enter comments into the IM window. Um, open up the IM window by uh, uh, placing your cursor over your avatar and clicking on IM and uh, share with other people that way. And then the, th the third thing is that you can always ask a question. So if you have a comment, um, you, can, you, can a you can pose your comment as a question and then I can publish it so that it, uh, other people can see it. I'll pull the slides up and we'll give you about two minutes to discuss this. Okay, well I see a couple people have um, have talked to each other and um, I didn't mean to disturb them because I, I see that they're still doing that. But um, but I was wondering, you know, maybe somebody had some ideas and would like to discuss those ideas with you. Um, and let's see if we can find a brave soul to click on their raise hand. And um, you're not going to bite them, right? I promise. Right. Can you hear me? I promise I won't bite. Yes. You promise. Okay. So, so somebody, please raise your hand and let's get a discussion going with Mary about some of your ideas. And this is really one of the best ways to learn and, you, and you're going to be helping everybody else out all, as well. Um, so, you know, otherwise, I guess, you know, I, you know, I can add, oh, good. We have somebody who's raised their hands. We have Kim. So, um, so let me let me bring him up. Hi, Kim. I'm I'm hearing seeing Kim's lips move, but I can't hear you. Ah, 
that's really a shame. Um, Kim, um, you know, maybe uh, I guess when we're when we're moving on, maybe maybe you and I will we'll see if we can troubleshoot and figure out why the sound wasn't working. Um, but um, but Kim did send you a message, um, and there is somebody else who's okay. And Christy is volunteering. So in the meantime, I'm going to pull myself down and let's pull Christy up. Hi, Christy. Hi. Can you I, hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, so what I do, I teach, um, I teach adults online, um, specifically with the PDA courses in the state of Florida. Um, we focus on, uh, most of our courses are, are focused and developed around students with disabilities. Um, so a lot of what we do focuses on UDL and it's, it's really the basis, uh, as well as differentiated instruction. Um, right. so something that I do specifically when I have read a couple of books on UDL and to preach it, you know, this is the way to do things. Um, I kind of decided, well, I can't just talk the talk. I got to walk the walk. <laughs> so um, what we did is we got together with a bunch of people and we've ta taken all of our syllabuses and we're working on making every one of them UDL. So the, the course that I teach, um, instead of for example, typically um, an adult learner will turn in a 500 word essay or, you know, some term paper type thing. That's just what we do. I mean, that's how we grew up. Um, but you know what? It's, it's more fun for a teacher to grade <laughs> if they do something a little bit different. So um, yes. I've had a lot of my adult learners turn in Paltoons. I don't know if you've heard of that. Yes. Um, yes. A couple of, I can't remember. A guy actually wrote a rap and he sang, he was like playing the guitar and singing about UDL, as a matter of fact. Um, so they've done a bunch of really interesting things and it truly makes it more fun as a teacher to grade. That's so excellent. I'm so glad you shared that. You're right, it's fun for everyone. Um, and I'm sure that you have a rubric for each of the options because that's really important so that when the learner picks a certain way, then they can see what your expectations would be of that. But absolutely, and, and I guarantee you that they will remember that content better because Definitely. they have done it in a different way. Definitely. Thank you so much for sharing yeah. that. It's great. So let's continue with your with your presentation then, okay? And then everybody else, um, feel free to, again, type in the IM window to uh, click on the ask button and ask questions uh, <clears throat> and or raise your hand um, and interact that way as well. So let me bring up the slides. Okay. So I wanted to spend just a little bit of time on the flipped classroom and I'm sure everyone kind of knows what flipped classroom is whether you've used a flipped classroom model or not. Um, if you're on doing online instruction, then you're always. But when we talk about flipped classroom, and you can move to the next slide, Mitch, um, it's really taking what used to be done during the, the classroom time and having that portion done at home and technology is a huge piece of that. So a technology tool is usually in place. It it's incentivizes student, it, it's a advanced organizer. It can also give the teacher understanding of where students are in their knowledge um, and access their background information and their background knowledge. So if you go to the next slide, this is just very quickly a graphic that kind of shows all of the advantage of, of doing a flipped classroom. So move on to the next slide. Um, it's really a structure where you provide directions and it's really important when you do a flipped classroom and use technology that the students understand very clearly what's the expectation and that the technology that you use is technology that they know how to use. It's something that you've done with them before. So you're going to provide the tutorial in some form, a video, uh, something that you want them to read and maybe you have text-to-speech available to everyone, uh, audio or images, 
and you're going to then scaffold activities and do interactive games at some points as a flipped classroom. And if you can build in some communication with the teacher as well about the reflection of what they saw when they did that at home, then that's another connection. So the next slide talks about then what do we do in the classroom um, and, and what are some of the th key things that you need to look at for technology for the classroom. And so um, you really are looking at the outcomes. What is it that you want them to gain from that flipped classroom piece? And I talk about an essential question in there. And an essential question is really a broader question that gets students thinking that you might pose to them either before they go home or as part of that flipped classroom piece. And that is a question such as, um, maybe how can reading unite a community? Or an essential question for our tonight's Ed Chat would be, how can how does your use of educational technology influence society in the years to come? Thinking broader about what we're talking about is that essential question. And then looking at a chunk of information for the flipped classroom piece. So the next slide really talks about some ideas of technology to use. Um, I'm not going to describe each of these because I think probably you're familiar and if you're not you can just plug it in on online and take a look at it. Um, but these are some of the technology tools that can be great. The Edpuzzle, um, you can actually select a video and then you embed questions in it. They watch a little bit of the video and then you ask a question. So moving on, Mitch, to the next slide, this references a handout that hopefully you downloaded before we started this EdChat. And I put this handout together really to have teachers think about flipped classroom in terms of the considerations for all learners. Um, identifying the core concept and then making sure that you take into consideration attention span, are you sure that they understand the vocabulary, that they have the digital literacy skills to do what you're asking them to do, et cetera. So if you can take a chance to um, kind of review this form and keep it handy when you plan your next classroom lesson, then that would be great. So the next slide then, we're going to move into really the intentional piece of a flipped classroom. And Mitch, I'm going to have you move one more slide. Advance one more slide. Whoops. Uh, yeah, I just want to say there is a there is a question um, about flip classrooms. You don't have to convert everything to a flip, flip, right? Or do you? I mean, you could really just say, you know, this year I want to take one or two or three of the lessons that I'm doing and try those one, two, or three as a flipped classroom. Could you could you do it that way? Uh, absolutely. And I don't I don't recommend that you do flipped classroom all the time. Um, I recommend that when you start a unit or halfway through when you're starting a new chunk of information, that that's when you would do a flipped classroom. And then the other nights, if you're doing homework every night, then you're using some kind of an activity that just reinforces what you've done with the flipped classroom portion of your lesson and the in-class portion of your lesson. So that's a great question. I'm glad that you asked it so we could clarify. It's, it's a tool you can use every once in a while. Um, some teachers do use it all the time, but that's at a more uh, secondary level where the students are used to that. So let's go into really determining the purpose of technology, and, and this goes beyond flipped classroom. This is now thinking about technology overall that you're using, and really thinking about why am I going to use technology here, or am I going to use technology here? Sometimes having your hands on a piece of paper and a crayon and moving it around the floor is the best way to reinforce a concept. So technology is fabulous, but sometimes hands-on takes its place and is more effective. So think the first question is, 
is technology the way I want to reinforce this concept? Is that the best way? And then you can take a look at, if so, well, what is the purpose? What is it that I want to do? Do I want it to be a tool for looking at similarities and differences? Is it looking at concepts? Do I want to build fluency with a particular skill? And so it's a game kind of format to practice a skill. Do I want to reduce cognitive load? And by that, I mean take concepts and eliminate extra um, things that are taking up thinking space and just really highlight those key concepts. Um, do I want to support executive functioning skills? Do I want it to be a step-by-step -step guide? Do I want it to be an organizer? So think about the purpose. The next slide really talks about intentional selection then. So you're going to select for a variety of reasons. A few might be to facilitate uh, the outcome to remove barriers, and that gets back to our UDL. Technology can definitely remove barriers for students. It can engage students. On to the next slide, it can be a great tool then for developing skill and fluency. So um, starting with a skill that you've gone over in class or in prior lessons, and then just really developing that fluency with it in a fun way. And if you use technology for that, it should be available at home and at school is the best way to do that. So then the next slide, Mitch, is two different slides. One is from a teacher standpoint, um, I will use technology too, and it just kind of reiterates what I talked about in the last couple of slides. Might be a good tool to just kind of cut that slide out and put it in your lesson planning book. And the next one is, well, then students will use technology to do what? Build skills, develop an artifact, demonstrate knowledge, or stay on task and stay focused. So take a look at the next slide then. This is kind of a four-step teacher framework that we go through for effective teaching when you are starting a new concept. First, you want to set a clear learning goal and a scale that says this is what it's going to look like when you get there. Because if you don't know where you're going, you're not going to know when you get there. Students need to know what the learning goal is, whether you are actually putting the standard up or you are reframing it in some way. What is your learner goal? The second step then is structuring and addressing that new learning content, the representation portion. Um, structuring student interactions with new knowledge, moving into practice and deepening understanding, and then finally uh, having the students do something with the information, develop an artifact. So let's take each of those then and talk about technology. In the next slide, we're talking about the clear learning goal. And a clear learning goal might might sound like students will understand and be able to, so they are going to understand a concept, and then what are they going to do to demonstrate that they actually do understand that? And so a great thing to do is to set, send out your goal prior to your lesson. This could be part of a, or it could be just a, a tweet in your classroom um, Twitter account, uh, a Socrative, a Today's Meet kind of platform, even a poll everywhere where you poll your students and plant a question and say our learning goal is going to be XYZ so that they all know what it is you're going to be doing. This is a great communication tool with parents as well so they know what you're going to be covering. Clear exemplars, and I've listed the uh, link to a really great tool that can help you develop goal mastery rubrics, and students can help you do that as well. So you might want to check that out. Um, and then really create and celebrate success by using blogs or websites or tweets to really celebrate what the students have done. So then moving into the next slide, we're going to talk about addressing new learning content. So it's really critical that you chunk that critical content into manageable chunks, just like we eat a steak. We take bites and uh, each bite at a time to get the full content. 
So pull in visuals and interactive, and here are some tools that are really great for doing that. Um, Pinterest, believe it or not, is a great tool for you and or your students to pull in images and ideas that show that new learning concept. Um, Padlet is another one if you haven't tried, you might want to take a look. It's a, an online bulletin board that students create the, the um, post-its that go on the Padlet bulletin board and then you can move them around and save them and archive for later use. So then moving into the next slide then, uh, now that we have those chunks of information, then let's have students develop fluency with that and deepen their understanding and really practice it. So some of the tutorials you might use, um, I've listed there. The Screen Chomp is great. Edu Creations is a good way to do that. Um, video Scribes, and I'm going to show you an example of that in a few minutes. Quizzes and games, we know kids love um, games, and it's a great way to practice and develop fluency with all kinds of things, vocabulary or math. And so I've listed a few there, even a wordle for identifying keywords in a passage or putting in the definitions of academic vocabulary it can be a fun way to practice that. And for accuracy and things like writing, spell and grammar checks, one that is a great one for kids who may have difficulty and even have dyslexia is called Got It. And it specifically looks for the kinds of spelling errors that those students might make. So then on our next slide, we're going to take a look at um, what students might do to show their learning, to represent their learning. And so there you see some um, examples of technology tools that can be great for that uh, as well. Uh, recap, Audacity are really fun. Reflection journals online uh, and scrapbooks can be a great way for students to represent their learning. So if you move to the next slide, it's kind of an introduction to one that I have found to be really exciting for kids um, at all grade levels, actually. And that is, uh, somebody mentioned Powtoon at the beginning. Sparkle is another online. It's called Video Scribe. And so imagine that you've just covered the concept of mammals and you've now moved into the subcategory of marine life mammals. And so you might put students in pairs or in groups, small groups, and they could create a video scribe to show that they understand it. So if you go to the next slide, this is one that I actually created to show A, it's easy to do and B, it can be a really great artifact for kids to show that they actually do know the difference between a marine life mammal and a mammal. And if you're familiar with this type of a tool, they can build in uh, voiceovers, they can put music in the background, they select the pictures and decide how fast or how slow it's going to be drawn, etc. So very motivating. So going on to the next then, and this is kind of a recap um, uh, overall overarching slide, big picture, and that is technology is fabulous and wonderful, but you need to connect it to a core standard. And hopefully by walking through those four steps of learning uh, and lesson planning and teaching and tying in some technology to each of the four, it's given you some ideas on how you might do that. So uh, Mitch, I don't know if we want to have them um, share a few more ideas at this point um, or wait until I go through the last few slides. So it would be, it'd be great to have um you know, somebody who from the uh, one, one of the participants then volunteered to come up and just talk about maybe some of the things they're doing in their classroom and get your opinion on how you might use uh, technology to to enhance the learning. So uh, so I'd love to see somebody raise their hand right now and just and and you'll you'll come up here and you just describe, you know, what one of the things are that you're teaching and maybe get some feedback from Mary on what technologies she might use to intentionally answer. Um, 
and you know in the meantime let's just say that I'm a you know I'm a fifth grade teacher and <clears throat> and I want to teach about um, this oh somebody's okay that's even better uh, I see Katrina has uh, volunteered I'm gonna pull myself down and I'll pull Katrina up hi hi Katrina and I haven't done this so you can hear me yes I can okay because so I'd like to get my classes more into this video I do everything asynchronously but I teach educational leadership and I always feel that like the future principals administrators aren't comfortable with the technology they're not going to really keep you know support everyone in the schools the way they need to and I see it as an equity issue for children so I'm trying to but our the the skill level varies so for them. So I've used Padlet, I've used, um, oh, let's see, where they put little videos up around a screen. I'm trying to think, um, VoiceThread, which okay. seems to be a nice transition, but I'm wondering more for their projects. We end up meeting so they can present, you know, they do a presentation, it's via PowerPoint, because uh, we always have trouble loading things. It, that seems to be such a drag for them if we try to do that using technology. So what could we do so we don't always have to meet for that last class? Okay. Uh, well, A, I'm really glad that you're aware of that and that it, it truly is an equity issue. Um, and we also have teachers who are not comfortable with technology too. Not everyone is a digital native nor comfortable. Okay, so and I certainly I'll, am not. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, but I find that most people, myself included, once I walk through something um, mm -hmm. and someone does it with me, then I love it so much that I can do it then and I have confidence to do it. So part of your assignment might even be to find a, a digital buddy, you know, a technology buddy that, that can help them actually create something and post it. And uh, in that way, you're, you're not making them independently on their own learn a new piece of technology. But their assignment is to collaborate because that's what good leaders do is that they don't necessarily do the technology. They encourage the technology and they learn it right along mm -hmm. with their teachers. So that could be built in as part of your assignment. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be great. And sometimes that happens in an impromptu way. I usually always have one person in the class who may be a tech director in their district. And we're always so yeah. thankful when we have that person. Yeah. Yeah. Answer questions, but maybe yeah. if I. But they. But, but every single one of your leader students should find themselves a tech mentor. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's part of our education uh, mandates, and so mm -hmm. you're helping them by making sure that they do that on their own, so that once your class is over, they still have that person. Thank you. So good. Good luck with that. I'm glad you shared that. That was a great example. So, um, so uh, I also want to thank Katrina for, for coming through. And um, we could move forward, but if there's another person here who would like to talk about what they're doing in, in your, you know, their school or their classroom and wants to come up and discuss it with Mary, uh, raise your hand. Uh, otherwise, um, I'll pull myself down and well, I, actually, so I was going to bring up the election. So, so you know, this. Um, one of the interesting things about the election is that you have p people who feel very strongly one way, very strongly another way, especially in this election. People who are keeping abreast with the people who aren't. You know, how would you balance that in, let's say, a fifth grade class, and how would you use technology to teach about the ele election process? Do you, do you so, have ideas? Yeah, I think that that's a, a great way to take skills that we're trying to get students to use and use real life scenarios. So mm -hmm. I would have kids working in groups and not necessarily taking sides, but just taking a look at the election itself and the process and posing some questions and having them develop uh, some online kinds of tools to answer those questions. Um, maybe they do a, a man on the street interview with their parents uh, based on a posed question and then they put those man on the street videos together 
uh, to to share with others and other people on the, in uh, participating may have some good questions or some good answers to that as well. Okay, yeah. If you have some good answers, uh, please put them into the IM window. In the meantime, I'll pull myself down and I'll get your slides back up, Mary. Okay, thanks. Okay, so this, these last few slides are, are kind of pulling everything together that we've been talking about tonight. Um, and, and I want to share a really quick story that goes with this slide. I was flying to Chicago from LA one night taking the red eye and we all shuffled on the plane and, and we're hoping for four hours of sleep like you do on a red eye. And as we're taxiing down the runway, the pilot came on the intercom and said, welcome ladies and gentlemen to flight 462 on our way to, and then he stopped, but he didn't turn off the intercom and he said to somebody in the cockpit, where are we going anyway? Well, naturally, everyone on the plane gasped, and then eventually he came back on and said, oh, on our way to Chicago, sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight, which none of us did. But my reason for sharing that story is if you don't know where you're going, you won't know if you get there. And so that very first part, setting the learning goal, is critical that everyone knows, including you, the teacher, the pilot, where you're going, because if you're going to Chicago, you want to make sure that you take the right route. So you determine your core standard and then you determine what is my outcome? What is my learning goal? You then look at everything that's available to you and all of the students in your classroom and you analyze that. You define the barriers and then you identify the methods and materials and the technology tools that you feel can meet those goals and you implement it. So keep that slide somewhere in your planning book so that you make sure that you go through that whole process to really strategically select technology. So the next slide then is an important one as well, and that is that the tools that we choose for students, particularly tools for assistance such as the dictionary, the thesaurus, the um, text-to-speech, we want students to ultimately be able to use those independently because we want to develop independent learners who love to learn. And these tools can be lifelong tools for them. And so make sure that you're building into independence. Uh, the next slide is just another tool that is a great tool. It's Newzella. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, but it is online journal articles about a lot of different subjects that you can instantly reduce or increase the lexile level of the reading for access. So everyone in the room can be reading the same article, but at a lexile level that's appropriate for them. That's a great, um, a great example of a good technology tool. So the next slide just is kind of a, a visual of tailoring technology for intended learner outcomes, for reducing barriers, and for identifying and meeting learner characteristics. So the next couple of slides I did specifically for students with special needs, whether they have an IEP or not, some considerations that you may want to keep in mind, and that is, um, what are, do they have some significant deficits that are going to create barriers, and so how can you use technology to get over those barriers or eliminate those barriers? Um, how can we reduce the cognitive load so that they, they get information in small chunks and build on that, supporting their executive functioning skills and supporting short-term memory because that is oftentimes a deficit area. So the next slide talks about cognitive strengths and looking at the cognitive strengths and then selecting technology to address and to use those strengths. Uh, considerations then for media selection at the next slide is important and this is kind of a summary. Make sure that the vocabulary that is used in the media or in the technology is vocabulary that the students understand. When you start using a new tool, that's probably a whole lesson in and of itself is looking at the vocabulary and the terminology of that tool 
and making sure students are comfortable with it and understand it. The next slide then talks about when you do introduce a new technology tool, it's important to do it well and to do it in a way that it is going to be comfortable for the students. Um, the example of the adult learners in the leadership class is a great one because um, not everyone is comfortable with technology. Not all uh, tech tools are intuitive. Um, and so with when you use it for the first time, pair students up and have the task a very fun and engaging task so that the sole purpose of that first time use is to use the technology and become familiar with that technology. Um, use a critical eye when you're choosing it and trying it out. I've read some articles that list some technology tools and when I go to them they really aren't something that I could recommend or would want to use with my students and it's full of spelling errors or errors so you need to take a look at them and, and with a critical eye. Um, give scaffolds for use. Maybe you take screenshots or step-by-step -step charts or you download tutorials for the tool that they can go to when they're at home using it and don't have access to you or someone else that can use it. Um, assign a tech buddy student um, for adults and for students. Um, my high schools and middle schools have a genius bar in the library where students get credit for being students that are pretty tech savvy that other students and adults can go in and get help on their technology and that that's been a great great tool for us. So the last slide then Mitch is a resource that I wanted everyone to know about and it's commonsense.org is full of great resources for core standards and for core aligned technology so when you need a new idea or help with deciding how to teach a new concept you might want to go to that website and get some ideas from that. So um, I'm happy to take any other questions uh, or comments that you have, and I really appreciate everyone attending. Ah. Hi, Katrina. Hi, sorry again. I also have a high function. One, my older son's a high functioning child with autism. He's a 10th grader. And like other students, or even with ADHD, um, that inertia to start your writing, because as a 10th grader and smart boy, but just to get the written work in. So is there, you know, I think of the graphic organizers and things like that, but is there something interactive? that is good for that type of student that will help them get that idea on paper? Well, I think anytime you use technology, most I would guess he's probably motivated by technology. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and so any kind of a writing tool that's at his level and um, builds in kind of a reinforcer is a great tool. Um, off the top of my head, I can't say what one of them would be, but um, kind of take a look through and see, um, you know, the brainstorming ones are, are fine, but it has to then lead into a written response. Mm -hmm. And so I would start with things like even just a, a online journal or Padlet where he's just doing sentences on post-its and then he can move them around okay. and create yeah. a paragraph might be really a good start for him. Okay, that sounds good. And then my other son, um, has dyslexia when he writes. He can read, but it's putting it back out. And we've, and again, it's, we're in a small, rather rural school district and trying to, we've had Dragon Dictation on his IEP for about three or four years, but really getting that incorporated, and it's not just for him, but other kids who could benefit too. What is a, a good way to really help teachers feel comfortable with it? Or, because um, you probably do it at a much larger scale in your district, then, you know, ours is very small. 
Yeah. So, well, um, yes and no. I mean, the size of the district isn't really the critical piece. It's getting something that's user friendly. And so mm -hmm. we've actually, Dragon Speak is, is fine, but it's a little cumbersome. Uh, an iPhone is much easier to use. And so mm -hmm. and you, most smartphones now in the Notes app have the ability to dictate and it's become quite quite good and then you can um, copy and email that and then that's the start for your written composition that you finish so i would talk with the school personnel about is there another tool that's going to be a little easier because dragon speak especially for kids it sometimes takes a long time to train it and it was it was built using adult male voices and so sometimes kids voices it doesn't recognize very well okay now well, that's a great idea all right and very simple too so thank you yes absolutely so you um what are you going to be talking about at, at FETC just to, to kind of close out so I'm going to go into, into more detail. I'm going to be talking about a lot of the same material, but but really taking a look at um, uh, using the tools that we have now. The example that we just did with the dictation into a smartphone. Um, you know, many teachers have uh, elaborate systems for writing down homework. Well, kids now can just go in and take a picture of it on their phone, and there it is. And and so, really talking about modernizing how we use school and also the intentional use, and how we can help um, students with special needs, particularly using technology. And it sounds like it's less about the tools, although you want the tools to be simple. But it's more about what is it that you want to accomplish. Yes, exactly. It's knowing what you want to accomplish and then matching the tool. Well, and, and actually, and I'm going to modify that one more, one, a little bit more. Knowing what you want to accomplish and not just targeting the average. You know, understanding that there's going to be a range of abilities and interests and, um, well, and, and, and abilities along different areas. Because somebody may be great in writing, but may not be so great in reading, or maybe really good in math, but not so great in science. And, um, and it's to be able to tailor your materials so that people of all different abilities and interests and backgrounds can all move forward using technology. Designing, right? designing to the edges, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, so, so uh, I hope people get a chance to come down to FETC and, and, and see you. Um, I will say that, gee, I really hope everybody memorized all the notes because I don't know that I want to make the notes available. Uh, no, just kidding. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna post the, the the slides up on the website so that people can download them um, because there was a, you know, you went through them very fast, but there was a lot of really really great information on every single slide. Um, so you you could really develop a semester course just on the material put into these into these slides if you wanted to. Yeah, you probably that's knew true. That. Yeah. And and I I hope if any of you do come to FETC, find me and and um, say hi. I'd love to chat with you and see how you're using some of this information. Great. And um, and find me too. <laughs> so um, and hope to see you in another review tomorrow night, where where uh, we have Fred Andy and and some of the sessions that we have coming up at uh, Ed Chat Interactive. Mary, thank you very much, and uh, we'll be in touch, and we'll definitely see you in Florida. Thank you. I look forward to it. And um, now, uh, for our next act, everybody, uh, your homework tonight is to uh, watch the World Series and root for your favorite team. So this is Mitch Weisberg signing off for EdChat Interactive. Hope to see you soon, and have a very good night, everybody.